Hello everyone, and welcome to the National Association of Plant Breeders, otherwise known as NAPB, webinar series called The, Select the Science of Selections. My name is Leah Ruff, and I will be serving as your host for the NAPB webinar. You can find out more about NAPB at plantbreeding.org. You can also learn more about the upcoming annual NAPB meetings this July hosted in Pullman, Washington, titled Identifying and Utilizing Genetic Diversity. There will be tours of Pacific Northwest plant breeding and agriculture, networking mixers, a poster contest, and a wealth of fantastic speakers. Registration will open soon on April 6th. I'd also like to point out that our speaker today, Dr. Johnny Jenkins, was a lifetime awardee at the NAPB meetings last year hosted in Minnesota. So it is my great honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Johnny Jenkins. He is the director of the Crop Science Research Lab and research leader of the Genetics and Precision Agriculture Research Unit of USDA ARS at Mississippi State University. Dr. Jenkins received his bachelor's from the University of Arkansas and master's and PhD from Purdue University. I'd also like to point out that Dr. Jenkins has a very distinguished background with over 50 years of research with the USDA in cotton host plant resistance. He has published over 500 research papers and is a fellow in the American Society of Agronomy and Crop Science Society of America. He was also inducted into the ARS Science Hall of Fame. Today, Dr. Jenkins will be speaking about cotton breeding and genetics in his presentation. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. So now I'm going to switch the control of the screen over to our speaker, Dr. Jenkins. Good afternoon. I work with Agriculture Research Service at Mississippi State, Mississippi. I worked at this location in cotton breeding and genetics for 54 years. Today in this webinar, I'm going to briefly describe some of our historical cotton research that we've done at this location. Then I'll switch and discuss some of the current research that's going on. Between the historical research and the current research, um, I'll show a timeline that what's happened in cotton production, and actually would discuss most of the things that's happened in cotton production since antiquity, because most of the changes in cotton production have been made during my lifetime. So sit back and enjoy the slideshow today, and uh, notice how this has affected the social fabric of not only the South, but of the nation. Here I'll show you an aerial view of the ARS uh, complex at Mississippi State campus. We have a 20-acre campus here on the edge of Mississippi State University, and these are some of our buildings. In 2014, we had 22 scientists and uh, 46 administrative technicians, maintenance personnel, safety personnel, total budget of about $8.5 million. White gold. This is a common name for cotton, white gold. In the spring of 1961, the Boll Weevil Laboratory of the USDA ARS was under construction. I moved to Mississippi and joined ARS in the summer of 1961. The boll weevil is the key pest in cotton insect control, and in fact it's the key pest in everything that happens in, in cotton. The boll weevil moved into the U.S. about 1895 from Mexico, and by 1922 it was in the Carolinas. It had migrated completely across the cotton belt, and in many places it was laying waste to cotton production. Everything that we had to do in cotton production revolved around boll weevil control. This small group of scientists that joined ARS in 1961 at Mississippi State was given a simple mission. Our mission was to develop the technology to eradicate the boll weevil. Not to control the boll weevil, but to completely eradicate the boll weevil. That was our goal. Here you see some pictures of the boll weevil. I show you the larvae, the pupae, and the adult. Then you see an adult weevil feeding in the bowl. The boll weevil feeds in the bowls of cotton. It also feeds in the squares or fruiting buds of cotton. And anything it feeds on will be destroyed and will not produce a, a fruit for harvest. Here's a picture of some early attempts to control the boll weevil. This was a machine that would go through the field and would shake the stalks 
knock the weevils off into a pan that they would catch the, the uh, weevils in. At the end of the row, they would pour them out and kill them with uh, something it would drown them with. This machine worked quite well. It caught buckets of boll weevils. The problem with it was it left buckets of boll weevils in the field, and so it really was not effective for control, but it really caught a lot of boll weevils. Here's the about 1910 to 1915, one of the early means of controlling boll weevil. Use calcium arsenic. And you see here the man is riding the mule, cranking a calcium arsenic machine, spraying out calcium arsenic on either side of the row to control the boll weevil. We made a little progress with this, this picture here. You can see that the uh, calcium arsenate is being put out behind the, the man and then behind the mule rather than riding on the mule and dusting both of them at the same time. But when you come back to the second pass through here, you pick up a lot of calcium arsenate dust. Slight more improvement here, we find a multiple row machine and the mule and the man are riding in front of and above the cloud of dust. So our job was to eradicate the boll weevil. About 12 scientists joined this uh, task and we had an interdisciplinary team of entomologists, plant breeders, geneticists. Uh, we had some insect physiologists, even some plant physiologists, some chemists. Early on, we did some boll weevil genetic work. And what you see here is on the left is the wild type boll weevil. On the right is an ebony boll weevil. And the center is an F1 or slate boll weevil. As we began to look at the technology to eradicate the boll weevil, we were just coming off of a very successful program to control the, the screwworm fly in animals. And in that program, the sterile male technique had been used. In the sterile male technique, the insects are grown in the laboratory, sterilized, and then they're released into the environment. And with the screwworm fly, you release billions of sterilized insects there. They outcompete the normal number of males in the population to mate with the females. And since the screwworm fly only mated one time, if they mated with a sterile male, you effectively had stopped any reproduction of that insect. The program worked quite well with the screwworm fly. So it was tried for a number of years with the boll weevil. And we were never quite successful in our trials to use the sterile male technique to eradicate the boll weevil. Always be a few insects in the field at the end of the season. And the common theory was, well, sterile males are working, so these must be long-range migrants. Let's, let's have a bigger border. So the border would expand. And again, we'd find some insects at the end of the season still in the field. So we used boll weevil genetics to solve this problem for us. We decided to grow the ebony strain of insects, sterilize those insects, and release them. And if the insects we were releasing were not completely sterile, then we would find some offspring that either of ebony male had made it with an ebony female, or an ebony male had made it with a native male. Either way, we could tell this, the insects from the wild insects that were in the field. So at the end of the season, after a couple of experiments using the, the sterile male ebony, what we concluded was that we did not have the ability to sterilize the boll weevil. The boll weevils we were releasing were reproducing in the field, and that was never due for eradication. It might work quite well for control, but not for eradication. And so we saved a lot of money by deciding that the sterile male technique was not going to use in the boll weevil. And uh, it simply went back to a simple mutation, and the boll weevil were able to capitalize on this. We still had the, t the uh, task of how do we eradicate the boll weevil. Here you see a picture of a boll weevil pheromone trap. Pheromone is the sex lure of the boll weevil. With this trap and with the discovery of the boll weevil pheromone, we, would, we could put the trap in the pheromone in the field. And if there were just a few weevils in the field, we would catch them in the trap. If there was a lot of weevils in the field, we'd catch a lot of weevils in the trap. So we're able to determine which fields had weevils, which fields did not, using the pheromone trap. So this was one of the components of the boll weevil eradication. The other component was malathion. So using the pheromone traps, Dipos control the boll weevil in the fall of the year with malathion, then spring the next spring and with malathion in those fields that we had found insects in, we were able to eradicate the boll weevil. Beginning about 1980 in North Carolina and moving 
westward across the U.S. We've now eradicated the mole weevil. There's a small containment zone in the Rio Grande Valley, which we maintain as a, a barrier each year. It's treated with insecticides because weevils are continually migrating in from Mexico. But to forest cotton production areas in the U.S., the mole weevil has now been eradicated. Once we had eradicated the mole weevil or had the technology to do so, we turned our research and plant resistance to the next important pest, which was the key pest, mole worm, budworm. The mole worm is the same insect that we call the corn earworm, Heliothus zaya. The budworm is Heliothus varescens. These two bugs were the next key pest in cotton control, and we turned our attention to developing means to eradicate or to control these insects. We were able to use plant breeding to finally get effective control for bollworm insects. Here I'll show you some pictures of um, field plots of cotton in Mississippi. This cotton is BT cotton. Working with Monsanto at our location, we had the first field plots of BT cotton in the world, and it worked quite well. Here you see a, a plot of cotton that contains the BT gene. It's been infested numerous times with tobacco budworm, and you almost see no damage on these plants. Here's a plot without the BT. It's pretty obvious that uh, we had effective control with the BT gene. Here's a number of uh, plots you can see with varying degrees of uh, whiteness in them that actually indicates how, uh, how much different there was between the uh, events that we had in the field. And finally, the event that was uh, used by Monsanto and put into varieties gave us varieties that were very effective at controlling the budworm. This is what uh, a typical situation would look like. The plant on my right uh, does not have the BT gene, and the insects have gotten most of the fruit on it. The plant on the left has the BT gene, and you can see the very effective control. So now we've got the boll weevil eradicated. The boll worms are able to be able to control by BT gene. And we moved to the next important pest that was robbing uh, our, our profits in cotton, and that was nematodes. We began to work on genes for nematode resistance and for markers. Here I show you what the cotton roots look like with a root knot nematode. You can see the galls on the roots. Another picture here of galls on the roots. Again, you can see that with roots like this, you're going to have a major effect on cotton yield. So in 2010, we published a paper in which we had two markers for root knot nematode resistance genes. We found one gene on chromosome 11, one gene on chromosome 14. These genes have been around for a long time, but they've not been used for nematode control in a breeding program because of the difficulty in selecting for the plants that were resistant. But when we published our marker work in, 20, in 2010, now we felt like we could very rapidly see commercial varieties develop with resistance to root knot nematode. In 2012, we proved that marker assisted selection worked for root knot nematode. So we were able to select for the genes we wanted without having to grow the, the nematodes and expose the insect to them every generation. So in 2014, just four years after the markers came out, the first resistant varieties were commercially available to the growers, and now we have a, a means of controlling root knot nematode. But there's another nematode that's a problem in cotton also, and this is the reniform nematode, and we're currently working on resistance to the reniform nematode. Here you see the nematodes penetrating the roots. In this slide, I show you the egg masses. They've been strained the top hand blue. Uh, those are not galls. They're masses of eggs on the roots from the reniform nematode. In 2012, our IRS unit in Mississippi made a germplasm release of three reniform nematode resistant genes and markers for these genes. These genes were found, uh, the resistant plant was found by Forrest Robinson of ARS at the College Station, Texas. He sent us the resistant plant and we began to make crosses and look for markers and genes. In 20, 2012, we made a release of germplasm lines, and we told the, the people who the seed were released to that there are three genes involved, and we gave them the markers for each of the three genes. 
So we expect very shortly to see some varieties on the market that are resistant to reniform nematode. And I know that some of the companies are even working now with resistance to both nematodes in the same line. I want to talk a little bit about wild cotton now. I told you that our resistance to reniform nematode was found in wild cotton. Here you can see some of the diversity for uh, lens color in cotton. This is what a wild species of cotton looked like growing in the greenhouse Mississippi. These plants are photoperiodic. They don't flower in the short days of uh, the long days of summer here. If you grow them in the tropics, you see here a lot of flowers on these plants, but they're still quite wild, and there's a, a lot of work to be done moving a gene from one of these wild plants into something that's commercially available. Here we have a picture of uh, Here we have a picture of the F2 population from a cross of the wild Gazepium hirsutum with the uh, upland cultivar. You notice that most of the plants don't flower, and they're, they're very wild, very tall, very vegetative. But if you look closely, you can see a few plants here with bowls on them. Uh, here's a plant with a bowl. Here's a few open bowls, bowls over here. If you choose these plants with a few early open bowls, the next generation they'll be non-photoperiodic. Looking at something like this, or a plant like this, is a long way from a field of cotton like this. So it's a long way from the finding a useful gene in wild cotton to cultivars using these genes. White gold cotton. I want to talk to you now about my lifetime journey with cotton, from Depression era mules to the moon and back. Since antiquity, animal power has been used to grow cotton up until about the late 30s. Some of this animal power was four legs, some of it was two legs. So men and beast were the way in which we controlled and grew cotton for many, many years until the 1930s. In the early 30s, we began to see a few tractors that would uh, come on the market, and they were two-row tractors. They would handle a couple of rows of uh, plowing at the same time. It gave us a great advantage over animal power. Here's an early pickup truck about 1953. I want you to think about 1950s and today. This truck is a far cry from my ruby red F1, F-150 XLT pickup truck that has air conditioning, power steering, power brakes, GPS technology, satellite radio, seating for five, just a marvelous difference between vehicles in 1953 and today. You might wonder why I'm showing you this picture. It's not so you can see what I look like, but in 2014 I visited Cambridge, England, and I want to show you the little plaque right above my head here. This is a plaque that's on the Eagle Pub. This pub is very near the Cavendish Laboratories at Cambridge, and in the Cavendish Laboratories, Francis Crick and James Watson discovered the structure for DNA, and uh, they discovered that in 1953, and they first announced it at the Eagle Pub, and then the world knew that things were going to change. In 1953, I was a sophomore in college, and everything that's happened in genetic engineering has happened since 1953, actually since I started to go to college. And it began here with this work with Francis Watson, uh, Francis Crick, and James Watson. Fast forward to today, what a modern tractor would look like with a GPS cadence system. Uh, this doesn't happen to be cotton and soybeans, but uh, these tractors are used uh, extensively in, in agriculture production today. Let's look at the 1937 cotton crop. In 1937, Mississippi grew three and a half million acres of cotton. Now, if we look at 640 acres per square mile, we had 5,389 square miles of cotton grown in Mississippi in 1937. That would be a block of cotton about 74, 73 and a half miles by 73 and a half miles. If 40 acres per family farm or sharecropper farm, that would give us 16 farms per square mile. And 40 acres was about all a family could afford to plant 
and harvest and grow because it took every day, the whole family, the year long. So in 1937, we had approximately 86,225 farms of 40 acres each. Our production that year was 2.7 million bales. The total production of 2.7 million bales is, still stands as the highest record that Mississippi has ever produced. But our yield per acre has gone up considerably. I want to capture now with the 1937 crop what's happened in production agriculture. And I'm doing this as a tribute to what research has done and what producers have done is they've been innovative in producing cotton in this country. A similar story can be told about a number of crops. But let's fast forward to 2004. From 1937 to 2004, the Mississippi cotton crop, we had 1.12 million acres of cotton. And again, with 640 acres per square mile, that would be 1,750 square miles of cotton. That would be a block of cotton about 42 miles by 42 miles. But in 2004, each farm was about 5,000 acres of cotton. So 224 farm families could uh, farm the crop in 2004. 1937, it required 86,000 farm families. Our production in 1937 on 3.5 million acres was 2.69 million bales. Our production in 2004 of 1.12 million acres was 2.3 million bales. Almost the same production on a third of the acreage. And the number of people involved went from 224 family farms uh, from 86,000 family farms. Let's walk through a few of the operations in the 1937 and look at the amount of time involved in these. Breaking ground, this was the first thing you would do in the spring of the year, it would be run a breaking plow. Here you see a breaking plow that has about a 12 inch beam on it. This was used to turn the sod. So three and a half million acres, a 12 inch turning plow requires 8.3 miles of walking and plowing to turn one acre. So 3.5 million acres times 8.3 miles is 28 and a half million miles was walked just to turn the sod over for the cotton crop in 1937. This is equal to 1,145 times around the earth at the equator. That's a tremendous amount of walking. But remember we had over 86,000 farms or, or share crop farms. With 100,000 men plowing, that's only 286 miles per man. You can understand why we didn't have too many uh, fitness centers in 1937. If you grew up on the farm in 1937 and most everyone was on the farm, you were pretty fit to begin with. After the ground was turned, the next thing we'll look at is planting the cotton. Cotton planting was with a one-row planter and a mule. As a second picture of a one-row planter, just a slightly different, but still one row at a time. So what did it take to plant the 1937 crop in Mississippi? Well, three and a half million acres required walking eight and a half million miles just to plant the crop, or 342 times around the earth. Here's a major invention, quite simple. It's interesting how simple the inventions are once they've, just, once they've been made and you see what they can do. You simply tie two one row planters together, put a tongue in the middle and put a seat on it. And now the operator rides, she doesn't do any walking at all. Instead of walking 342 times around the earth to plant the crop, he walked zero miles. He sat on the seat and the mules only walked half as many miles as they did before. So a major invention, quite simple, but very important in production in agriculture. Here today we see some modern 12-row planters. When I came to the join ARS in 1961, this is what my research planter looked like. We had a belt planter and the seed were put on by hand in, in little V grooves on the belt and the seed were dropped in the row. This was a far cry up upward even from what I had when I was working in corn where I was using a, a one hill planter in our research plots in, in corn. Here's the planter I have today. It's a, a variable rate control planter, a vacuum planter. We can choose the uh, spacing we want for the, for the um, seed. 
We can drop one or two seats per hill. The operators are riding on air cushioned seats. They have headphones to communicate with one another. And uh, for a cry from the planner ad 1961, again, a lot of progress has been made. Here's another implement that's very important to uh, researchers. This is a various machine. This machine goes through the field and provides GPS coordinates for every measurement it takes. And it measures soil electrical conductivity, pH, and soil organic matter in one pass through the field. After the cotton was planted and it was out of the ground, the next job was cultivation of cotton. Cultivating cotton required two trips. One trip down one side of the row, one trip down the other side of the row. Innovations were made in plows where they had two sweeps or three sweeps, but still there's two trips down each side of the row to plow an acre of cotton. If you wanted a multi-row cultivator, just more men and more mules, you had a multi-row cultivator. You can see a lot of progress could be made, but this is similar to what has been done since antiquity. 1937, we had three and a half million acres of cotton. If you cultivate one side down once each side of a row, a primer would walk five miles to plow one acre. So he could plow about four acres a day and walk 20 miles. So it required 17 and a quarter million miles of walking to cultivate the Mississippi crop one time. That's equal to 690 times around the earth at the equator. You just can't hardly imagine how much time was involved in this. It required 862,000 man days to cultivate the crop in Mississippi in 1937 one time. With 100,000 plowmen, this would require about 8.62 days. And that's about what we had to do. About every 10 days, you had to plow. So the, the farmer would plow all the way across his 40 acres. By the time he got to the far side, it was time to start over again. Here's some of the early implements that were used in, in agriculture, not only cotton, but in other crops also. Again, you see nearly everything here is, is one row. Here's a major invention. Again, rather simple after it's done. Here you can cultivate both sides of the row at the same time. And so sometimes discoveries that are made in research and innovation don't have to be earth shaking, but they can have major effects, as you see here. Why didn't we think of this years ago? But it just didn't happen. Here's a 12 row cultivator, and some people have even more modern cultivators than that. During the growing season of cotton, there are a lot of operations that have to go on. One of those is irrigation today. Here's a modern center pivot irrigation system. Today we can also use uh, laser leveling and GPS technology and can landform the field and then use polypipe to irrigate the crop with. Now I'm going to talk about insect control in cotton, but there's another phase of cotton that I'm not going to talk about today, but it also came in the picture, and that's weed control. All the fields of cotton were full of crabgrass and other weeds, and they had to chop that out by hand to control it. But let's, let's just look at insect control. The boll weevil. The boll weevil dominated insect control before it was eradicated. It required insecticide sprays every three to five days after you found the weevils in the field, and usually that was pretty early in the season. So you can see if you're spraying insecticides every three to five days to control the boll weevil, Everything else takes second place to that. And you also have a lot of other pests you're controlling that you don't know about when you spray for boll weevil. Again, one of the early ways of controlling boll weevil was calcium arsenate. Much danger to the man of the mule with all that calcium arsenate fog going around him. About the early 30s, they began to use airplanes to apply dust insecticide in cotton fields. Delta Airlines, which I'm sure you've heard of today, was formed by some early ag pilots. They got together and started Delta Airlines. But in the early 30s, we were beginning to experiment with using airplanes to put out pesticides. Here's a, a nice picture with six airplanes flying across the field, applying calcium arsenate dust. And undoubtedly, it was for boll weevil control because in 1937, there was a lot of boll weevils. 
I joined ARS in 1961. By that time, uh, the World War II was over. Uh, we had a lot of organic insecticides, a lot of liquid insecticides. And the way we controlled insects in the early 60s was with something like a high and high boy and uh, using liquid insecticides. Then we moved up to closed cab uh, applicators of insecticides, much safer for the operator. And then came along the airplanes again. Far cry from the first biplane I showed you a few slides ago. You can almost see the, the eyeballs in the, in the pilot's eyes, they fly so low. Sometimes even use bow wings for planes for applying insecticides in fields. After the crop was grown, insects had been controlled, the season was coming to an end, we had to harvest the cotton. So let's look at what it required to harvest the cotton crop in 1937. Cotton picking by hand. It was long hours and tired backs. But it all had to be picked off one bolt at a time by human beings. A lot of time was involved in picking cotton. Cotton picking time, this is a common scene about the mid-40s. It involved the whole family. In fact, the whole community. There was mama, daddy, grandpa, grandma, junior, little ones, and the community. It was a happy time because the crop had been completed. We were harvesting and now maybe some money could grow to the farmer. But it was a long, back-breaking job harvesting the cotton. And with three and a half million acres of harvest, it was a busy time in Mississippi. Shortly after the 1960s, we began to have some early cotton pickers. This picker is mounted on a cotton tractor, on a, a common farm tractor, and the tractor is driven in reverse all day long. Then came the dedicated picker, a one-row picker, a major improvement in uh, cotton harvesting. Then we got the two-row pickers, which again was a major improvement. Today we have four-row pickers. In fact, today we even have six-row pickers. Now the cotton picker makes a module of seed cotton. Some make spare modules, some make round modules, depending upon the brand. Here's a picture of a module of cotton. It's got several bales wrapped in there that to take to the gin. And it's wrapped in plastic, so it's out of the weather. What we see here is a farm headquarters. It's got about uh, $100,000 worth of cotton sitting on the lot at the farm waiting to go to the gin. That's what our modern six-row pickers look like today. 1937, we had 2.7 million acres of cotton produced, no mechanical pickers. How many people did it take to harvest this 2.7 million bales of cotton? We can calculate that pretty accurately. It'd take about five Olympic gold medal cotton pickers to pick a bale of cotton in one day. Each one would pick about 300 pounds. It required about 1,500 pounds of seed cotton to make one bale. So five men times 2.7 million is 13 and a half million man days just to pick the crop in 1937. Where did all these man days come? If you remember the slide I showed you with the whole family in the, in the field, that's where they came from. Everybody in the state was picking cotton. Today, one of these cotton pickers can pick over 100 bales per day. And since it takes about five superstar hand pickers to pick one bale, that means that uh, it required 13 million man days to pick the crop in 1937. But today, one of these pickers can pick over 100 bales a day. So it replaces 500 people in the cotton field picking cotton with one picker. However, this picker sells for more than $500,000 each. At today's price, it's probably closer to $750,000 for a six-row baler picker and you order those pickers and then make them after you order them. After the cotton crop is harvested, it becomes a ginning. From antiquity, if cotton was going to be used for anything other than seed cotton, you had to gin the cotton. This is an early jerky gin, just two rollers, and the cotton seeds that were grown in Asia at that time were diploid cottons that had a, a slick seed or a naked seed. And you could squeeze that cotton between these rollers and the seed would squeeze out and you could uh, get the lint 
than to use to make uh, cloth with. Here's a picture of a gin. It's not the one that Eli Whitney invented, but it's on the same principle that Eli Whitney invented in uh, 1793. This gin could be used as a uh, research gin today. It's probably about uh, 10 saws in that gin. In the mid-30s up to 1950s, this is what a cotton gin stand looked like. We're made of wood. You can see all the smooth wheels, so it's driven by belts. It was usually powered by a steam engine or uh, some kind of gasoline engine. So fire was a constant hazard with these uh, uh, gins. But this is what a gin would look, a stand would look like, say, in the mid-50s. Fast forward to today. This is a modern high-speed all-electric gin. This gin was uh, built on, a couple of years ago in Knoxville County in Mississippi. The gin is computer controlled. About five people can run the whole gin. Operation has changed considerably. A great deal of progress has been made. After the cotton was ginned, had to be spun into cloth. Here I'll show you a, a hand spinning wheel for cotton, for wool, or for flax. This wheel will be used uh, to spin the cotton into thread that, or yarn that can then be used to make cloth with. The spinning jenny, which instead of running one spindle will run about 20 spindles, was invented in 1764 and patented in 1770. So the spinning technology was ahead of the production technology in the early part of this century. Here's a picture of Startwell Mills. In the 1930s, many mills operated in Mississippi. This mill here in Startwell was built in 1901 and closed in 1962, one, one year after I came to Startwell to work with ARS. The Stonewall Mill, the Stonewall, Mississippi, was built in 1868. It was the last mill in Mississippi to close. It closed in 2002. In 1901, Mississippi State University had a textile school complete with a, a model spinning, uh, spinning mill. So they were doing research on how do we do a better job of spinning cotton. So you can see the spinning technology was slightly ahead of the production technology. Here's Startwell Mills today in 2014 is being renovated into a mill convention center. In 1901, the city of Startwell authorized $125,000 bond to build the Startwell Mills. And it operated until 1962. So it operated 61 years. They spun cloth, yarn, and wove it into cloth. It was called Startwell Chambray. They made it in eight colors. It was produced at one time and shipped around the world. A very fine uh, quality cloth that was made in the mill here in Startwell. Well, I've shown you some changes that's happened in uh, agricultural production over the years. Life also advances. You saw that first picture of me when this thing started. Here I was in 1962, shortly after I came to the Bull Weevil Lab. Here about 1995, we're in the Arch Monument, St. Louis. We've been to visit uh, Monsanto, look at their biotechnology program, and these are some of the graduate students. This guy here on the left is Russ Hayes. Dr. Hayes is now my uh, support scientist. Dr. Doug Shoemaker, uh, Dr. Shoemaker worked for a number of years with Monsanto, is now retired and in business for himself. This is Dr. Chris Cheatham. Worked briefly as a plant breeder for ARS, and now and then he joined the FBI. He's an FBI agent now. It's Dr. Shannon Crawley. After graduation, he began to work with uh, Monsanto. He still works with Monsanto in the southeast. And this is uh, Jay. Jay worked with us uh, for his master's degree, then uh, went to work for APHIS. He still works for APHIS. I think these guys that we trained and others that we can show you pictures of, are going to be the future of cotton. Because here I am, 2011, time waits on no man. I'm sitting on the porch at the uh, Cotton Brook Tour at the St. Joe Experiment Station in St. Joe, Louisiana. Let's briefly look at our current research. What we're doing is developing some breeding population useful for the next 50 years. Chromosome substitution lines, they're forced, forced there are three tetrapod species of cotton plus the Cassipian rosutum, which is the cultivated species. The three tetrapod wild species were developing chromosome substitution lines in cooperation with David Stelly at Texas A&M University. In this program, we substitute one chromosome 
from a tetrapod species into their hirsutum uh, species. So when we finish, we have we could have 26 chromosome substitution lines for each of the three wild species of tetrapod cotton, and this will be a way of getting genes from these wild species into upland cotton. Another population we developed is a randomated upland population. We took 11 diverse cultivars covering the, the cotton belt, and we looked at the pedigrees. They were very diverse. We crossed these together to make 55 F1s. We randomated for five generations and produced this population called RMUP. We have another population we have produced, which is randomated Barbadensi upland population. We took 18 chromosome substitution lines from Barbadensi, crossed them with three cultivars, Random made for five generations, and then made this population. And then we have the RMPAP, random mated primitive accession population. We took 34 exotic cottons that were photoperiodic, converted them to data neutrality, crossed into four cultivars, random made population. These populations were released to the general public. All commercial breeders and private and uh, public breeders received a thousand seed of each of these populations. So they had a large enough population to uh, begin to select in. Also, we've developed 555 recombinant bred lines from RMUP population. We begin to map fiber and yield traits in these lines. And we've got 180 recombinant bred lines from the randomated barbadensis upland population. Again, we're going to use this for, for mapping traits that we've moved in from barbadensis into upland cotton. We also have an association mapping project with the National Cotton Variety Trials with 50 years of data. For the last 50 years, there's been a National Cotton Variety Trial test run across the U.S. We have that data, and we're beginning to look at this now using association mapping um, technology. And uh, one other thing I'll mention will be an RNAi to modify phytochrome production. We have a project we've been working with scientists in Uzbekistan for the past 10 or 12 years. There we've use RNAi technology to put in a 213 base pair fragment from phytochrome A1 gene into cotton. What we find is an increase in fiber length, increase in the number of roots that are produced, in particular the, the feeder roots, increase in earliness, and an increase in drought tolerance. So we think that these uh, populations that we're developing, recovery and bread lines, are going to be good for a long time. I hope you've enjoyed uh, looking at some of the things that's happened in cotton production. White gold has been good to me, and I thank you for listening to us today. Any questions, I'll be trying to answer those now. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, we will take those questions now, and just as a reminder, for those of you who missed the beginning of the presentation, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. If the question box is closed, you can click the small triangle next to the word question to open it. And um, once I receive those questions, I'll read them out loud to Dr. Jenkins so he can answer them. We have about 15 minutes. We currently don't have any questions in the question box. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by asking a few while, oh, here comes one, I'll just, so has there been a big push for organic cotton production? Okay, let me comment a little bit on organic cotton production. The cotton production is a very competitive uh, endeavor for a farmer. At the world market price and uh, the cost of production, there's not a lot of profit in cotton. But if you do it just right, you can still make good money. There has been, in the past 30 years, several attempts at production of organic cotton. Currently, the best organic cotton production areas are in West Texas, near the Lubbock area. And uh, those, those farmers are growing cotton without use of pesticides. And primarily, it's because there are not many insects in that area that are able to do this. There is one uh, cotton breeder that I'm aware of. It's Dr. Jane Deaver, the Texas A&M University at Lubbock. She has a program developing varieties, especially for the organic market. And uh, if you want to know some more information about that, you can contact Dr. Jane Weaver, and she'll be able to supply that for you. OK. Next question is, would you comment on the relative importance of genetic gain, changes in production practice, and or the synergy between the two? Uh, repeat that question, please. 
So uh, can you comment on the relative importance of genetic gain and changes in production practices or the synergy between the two? Well, there's certainly some synergy there because uh, we're doing a better job of controlling insects, a better job of controlling weeds, and we've got better varieties. Um, in 1937, the largest crop Mississippi has ever grown average year was 377 pounds of lint per acre. Today it would be near two bales per acre, uh, approximately 1,000 pounds of lint per acre, about three times or two and a half times the yield it was in 1937. Uh, we also have some producers in Mississippi and some in uh, Texas that are making as much as 2,000 pounds of lint per acre. That's primarily because of the increase in production practices that give us a, a better chance of producing a good crop and the genetics that the breeders are brought to the table. Our varieties are earlier, they're making a better quality lint, and uh, they're making more yield per acre. Would you cons what would you consider to be the most, um, would be the single most significant achievement in your career with the USDA? Well, the single most event would be hard to really say. I was going <laughs> to say bowl weave eradication and the role we played in that was a major turning point in cotton production in the country. The BT and genetic engineering technology that came in in the late 80s and early 90s was another major change in cotton production. Over all of this um, period of time, working 54 years with ARS, being on campus at Mississippi State University, I mentored about 70 or 75 graduate students. They also will be a major contribution. The future is what we've done for other people, and uh, the future is in good hands. Uh, our, some of our graduate students are working for most of the major uh, seed breeding companies today, and they'll continue to make contributions for years ahead. Yeah, and a related question with your over 50 years of experience, do you have any advice to students as they journey into their careers in plant breeding? Uh, it seems that nowadays most people don't uh, work in one job for 50 years, uh, but you have, and so do you have any advice of to students going into it? Yeah, my advice to a student is to find something you enjoy doing so that every day when you get up, you're glad to go to work. And then your job becomes something you enjoy doing rather than something you're doing for a paycheck. And if you find something you enjoy doing, stay with it. And you'll make great progress. Work with people. You can't do it alone. Particularly today as the field of genetics is, and plant breeding has gotten to be more complicated and has involved both field selections and genomic selections in the laboratory, it takes a team to make things go. So learn to work with a team. If you're a graduate student, pay attention to the graduate students around you. Look who you're in school with. They're either going to be your competitor, your employer, or your counterpart with the same company in the years ahead. So learn to get along with people. All right. Uh, I, is there any progress on naturally colored cotton? Could you comment on that? The organic cotton market started in the U.S. with colored cotton, uh, and they were making a, a, a brown, it was a brown lint, and uh, that worked quite well, but it was a really small niche market. Today there is some breeding going on to try to improve the fiber quality of colored lints, uh, primarily brown lint cotton. It's not a major market. It's not a major uh, emphasis in the cotton breeding program. Okay. So the next question has um, is, has there been much interest in identifying cotton ger germplasm that is naturally resistant to pests, um, so breeders can move away from reliance on, say, BT genes? There's been a lot of uh, work on that. Uh, as far as the boll weevil is concerned, we found a number of cotton lines that were resistant to boll weevil, and we published on those. And that germplasm is available, you know, in the in the collection if people would like to work with it and develop some uh, lines of cotton that are resistant to boll weevil. Uh, as far as boll worm is concerned, there's some resistance there, but the boll worm feeds on so many different crops that it's very difficult to control with uh, native genes. 
There are some genes that are working as native genes for um, lagus control, or tarsh plant bug in cotton, and uh, the nectarless trait removes some of the feeding sites for nymphs of the tarsh plant bug and gives us about a 50% reduction in uh, damage from tarsh plant bugs. We had, we, we had worked a number of years looking for good traits for resistance to worms and tarsh plant bug when the BT change came along and that's when we were able to work with Monsanto and uh, move that technology into production practice very, very quickly and easily. We had all the field techniques worked out to do that. Okay. Could you comment on how the BT gene has held up? Is, um, is the control of the, the bullworm um, as much as it has been in the past? Yes. Uh, when they first started, there was only one uh, gene there. Now there are two modes of action or more, and the um, genes for control of bullworms. Uh, not only does uh, Monsanto have some technology there, but the other companies, Dow, Bayer, they have their own technology uh, to go with this. So uh, the genes held up quite well. We don't have any major resistance to the, the BT gene, but uh, when the BT cotton is grown, you also need to have a refuge in most states, and uh, that's a part of your field that will not have any uh, BT genes in it would allow some insects to mate there that could build up a population that would, could mate with resistant insects and reduce the likelihood of developing resistance. Okay. Our next question is, how do you foresee the cotton journey in competition with synthetic fibers? What makes cotton uh, still stand out with such competition? There's always a competition for uh, fibers, either cotton, wool, flax, are synthetics. Uh, the biggest thing that cotton is going for it is it's absorbent and it's comfortable. Uh, there's a great loyalty to cotton products in this country and in the world because of the comfort that you find from cotton. The price of synthetics and cotton have to be somewhat taken into consideration if you're in the spinning business so that you make sure you're making a profit with what you're doing. But uh, cotton is by far the most um, comfortable fabric that you can have compared to synthetics. All right. The next question is, knowing all the advances on the last 50 plus years in cotton, based on your experience, what type of research would you advise cotton scientists in private or government to focus their research on in the next 5, 10, or maybe more years? I think we need to continue to look for pest-resistant genes. That's not only nematodes and uh, insects, but we have diseases too. There's a disease called cotton leaf curl that's in Pakistan and, and that part of the world. And uh, well, there's a preemptive program that's going on now looking for resistance to that uh, cotton leaf curl virus. Of course, it's not in the U.S., so the program's going on with the U.S. cooperator in Pakistan. So I'll continue to work on uh, resistance traits. Also, as we get faster and faster spinning mills, get away from the slow spinning gene frames of the 1700s and the, the slow uh, spinning of the 1930s and 40s and moved to modern high-speed spinning. Length and strength become important and uh, we have to think about improving those in fiber and in, in cotton fiber. But all in all, yield is what we, the farmer gets paid for. So we need to focus on increasing yield and using less water. Cotton is a pretty drought-tolerant crop. But if we could make it more drought tolerant, it even would have an even higher place in, in competition with other crops uh, for limited water is going to be available. Could you comment um, further on the drought tolerance breeding that you're doing? You showed in a picture that um, a Mississippi field with being with irrigation or most of the fields in Mississippi irrigated. If they're not, um, then could you tell us about your drought breeding? Uh, a large percentage of the cotton acres in Mississippi is now irrigated, either with polypipe or with uh, center pivot irrigations. There's also a, a, a good um, percentage of acres that's 
in the south is rotated cotton and corn. And so you, we do need irrigation for corn to ensure corn crop. And so we, that's one thing you can do with irrigation. You can go to a ro rotation uh, system when you're cotton, when you're corn. That makes a very good rotation, and this is a good way to get yield increases also. Do you see the impact of drought or climate change on cotton yield? Climate's been changed at this time immemorial. <laughs> so it's hard to know exactly what you're talking about there. But there has been some work that's been done with uh, in growth chambers where they've increased the temperature during the growing season, and uh, they've also increased the CO2 levels during growing season. Both is usually favorable for cotton, and uh, if it were to warm up, then the area in which cotton could be grown would move north a few, a few miles. There's been some interest in uh, F1 hybrids of cotton, and I know in India they, they plant out F F1s, or at least they did at one point, and so I was wondering, um, do you foresee that cotton breeding could go in the U.S., might go to that type of fashion? There's been a lot of effort in the U.S. to produce hybrid cotton. There's no question but what we can get a yield boost with hybrids. But cotton is an often cross-pollinated crop, so it's primarily self-pollinated. It's not the pollen's not wind-borne; it's been moved by hand or by insects. And we've never had a good system to produce large amounts of hybrid seed when you had to do it by hand. In India and in China, where we're growing some hybrids, it's all hand-pollinated. To produce the F1 hybrids, then they produce F2 seed for uh, sale to the growers. There is an opportunity here for, the, for some of the graduate students to think about as time goes on, and you got a career in plant breeding. A touch broad crop like cotton, it has two genomes in it, a genome and a D genome. It's possible, I believe, to capture the the dominance components of heterozygosity in cotton by having the plus alleles in one genome and the minus alleles in the other, then the touch fluid actually becomes heterozygous for that locus. That That is an area that we need to look at and see if we can exploit some of that as we move into um, ways of increasing yield. Uh, this is not much been work, work been done in this area, but I think it's a possibility it could be could be done. Um, in one of the pictures, you showed a bale of uh, cotton. How much would one of those bales weigh? Uh, what I showed was a round module wrapped with okay. plastic. Okay. I believe there's about uh, 8,500 to 10,000 pounds in one of those modules. That would make wow. about it'd make about it takes about 1,300 pounds of seed cotton to make one bale of cotton. A bale is uh, approximately 400, uh, 500 pounds of, of lint. Wow. Okay. Has there been any thought of there being problems with soil compaction with such heavy equipment and those heavy modules? A lot of the farmers now are looking at no-till. Uh, no-till works very good in, in uh, cotton in the areas where it's being used. Also with the GPS guided equipment, uh, tractors and things, and with larger equipment, it undoubtedly is heavier but you keep the same wheel tracks, and when you're instead of going down every middle with your tractor, now you're cultivating 30 rows at a time or 24 rows at a time, and so with keeping the same wheel tracks, uh, you do compact that area, but all the rest of the field is not being compacted. Compaction is, is something everybody has to be concerned about in anything you do in agriculture. Okay, well we have run out of time, and I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and for your questions. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar, as well as all the other webinars, webinars in this series, will be available at eextension.org slash plantbreedinggenomics. If you have more questions, you can get them answered at eextension through the option Ask an Expert. Thanks so much again for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Jenkins.